So we are feeling very grateful to have this opportunity to share a little bit about how we work in this wind horse model with elders and end of life. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Emily, and I've been working with this organization for 10 years. Um, started when I was an intern here at Naropa, and never left. Uh, <laughs> found something of a home. <laughs> um, I now work as a supervisor and a team leader, and I work in our education, outreach, and admissions departments. And I'm very honored to have the opportunity to introduce these powerhouse women on our panel today. <laughs> and I'll start with Kathy Emery. Kathy is a graduate of the Naropa University from 1980 and has been a practitioner of the Windhorse approach since 1981. She currently works at Windhorse Elder Care and Windhorse Community Services as a supervisor, therapist, and educator. She continues to feel very dedicated to the vision of joining contemplative view and practice in her work with elders, the dying, those struggling with extreme states of mind and their families. And I'll add that she is a pillar of wisdom and love for the many communities that she participates in. And we are very privileged to have her as an integral part of ours. Jody Sharp. Jody has been a professional in the fields of elder care and mental health for two decades. After a successful career in finance and human resources in the private sector, a significant loss in 1991 changed the course of her life work. She learned to meditate at a Benedictine monastery in Oklahoma and moved to Boulder in 97 to attend graduate school here at Naropa. While completing a master's degree in contemplative psychotherapy, she concurrently held the position of assistant controller. Jody had a strong desire to develop right livelihood and envisioned working with ordinary life transitions, such as aging and dying, within a contemplative framework of presence and mindfulness. She manifested this aspiration in 2000 when she co-founded Windhorse Elder Care. She is our owner and director, whom we lovingly refer to as our Mama Mare. <laughs> she continues to dedicate her life to working with elders and families around aging and end of life issues by creating circles of mindful care. And then Stephanie Kinberg. She has 20 ex years of experience working in various settings, including, including inpatient psychiatric, physical rehab, skilled nursing facilities, and home care agencies. Currently at Windhorse Elder Care, she's our director of operations. Her clinical work consists of being a supervisor and team leader. Over the past six years, she has worked at Windhorse Elder Care, Windhorse Community Services, and Mindful Works. She's worn many hats, having 10 different positions in all. From 2007 to 2012, she attended a special education program in India and received a degree in Buddhist studies and Tibetan translation. In addition to her work at Windhorse, she is currently working as, as a translator with the Verochana Legacy Translation Group. And my little addition is she's a woman that radiates compassion and aliveness. And uh, Kathy will begin our discussion today. Is this okay? Just, it should be closer. Yeah. Is that good? Okay. Great. Well, welcome, everybody. It's so good to see you all here, um, to hear about um, the vision of this work and the work that we love and, and the kind of um, circles we can create all together. Windhorse Elder Care is the only Windhorse in the world that's working with elders at this time, I'll say. The hope is that this will spread, you know, that, that there will be other elder care um, situations, elder care and dying, you know, support for those dying, and birthing, you know, which, which is cover the whole spectrum. So it's been, uh, so it began 20 years ago, and I'm having a hot flash, so just so you know. <laughs> Comes with the territory. Um, 20 years ago. <laughs> Jody Sharp, as you heard in her bio, um, had an experience that changed her life, and she'll go into detail when it's her turn to speak. But 
so she she had this seed planted in her um, through this experience to have Windhorse um, services, Windhorse principles for elders and those dying. So that seed it began as a seed, but then it it kind of sprouted. The seed sprouted. And then it took root. It took root with other people, other colleagues. You know, you heard some references in the other um, present presentations mm -hmm. with the other Windhorse uh, community services groups. So it took more hold, and it it's created. Now, now there are many um, deep roots, deep tap roots for this approach. And I, we like to think of these different Windhorse organizations as being part of an Aspen Grove. You know, they're all connected. They're connected but they're ind independent, they're individual, but they all you know, are connected to one another. And Jody just shared with me that, that Aspen Groves are the largest, how did you say it? Organism. Largest living, or organism. living organism on the earth be with this interconnectedness. So it's a wonderful image <laughs> of connectedness. You know, we're talking about community. And uh, so anyway, just to mention that, and uh, Jody will share her story more. Uh, later, you know, about her inspiration. But I wanted to also mention briefly, which again, if you were here Thursday night, you heard reference to the team for Ed Podval when he came back to uh, Boulder after being in life retreat for 12 years. He was in life retreat and then came back to Boulder and he was very ill. He was actually terminally ill. And so we created a team for him. So Ed Podval, you know, one of the originators of this model and this vision, and here he is um, at this point in his life, and in a sense, coming full circle to being a client with a team. And so Ed was the client with this team that we created, volunteer team. It was all volunteer. He had housemates. He had just the whole, Jody and I were on that team. This was 2002. And um, I just gapped out, but I remembered also. And that's what you'll hear about today as well, <laughs> in the elder wor world. Um, that at the last conference we had was 2003, and Ed was here, Ed Podwell was here, and he was the keynote speaker as a client. So and the focus of the whole conference was basic attendance, and he was talking, so I've got goosebumps, so it was, yeah, so it was amazing. It was as if planned. And of course, it was life just arising. And also that year, just to say, there was a team, there was a um, film crew from Switzerland? Were they from Switzerland? Yes. Switzerland, yes, who had read the book you know, that Ed wrote about the model and um, were very inspired. And they heard that he was back in Boulder and of his, they heard about his condition. So they came that year and they filmed him the whole year. They filmed all the activity that year, his teaching plus also everything that was happening. This, is, this film is called Someone Beside You. It was about alternative psychiatric care, so it was more than Ed's story, but it was definitely, the, there's Windhorse um, information in this movie that's very inspiring and, and intense. It's an intense movie. And then I want to mention also, um, and you should get the, tell me when my time is up. <laughs> Because <laughs> I seem to be going on. I seem to be. That's another quality. You're here in this elder world. <laughs> you know, I have stories to tell, right? Transmission, life the stories. When my parents became ill, so or aged, my parents from Chicago. I'm from Chicago. I moved out here. They were there. I was here. Long distance caregiving, and at some point, we were able to bring my mother here, and we created a team for my mother. Some volunteers, some paid caregivers, but people I knew and loved, and they loved her. And so and my mother, who, who was, um, how, sh how shall I describe my mother? Um, a feisty, um, energetic, expressive, extrovert artist. <laughs> artist. Lovely, great woman. But we had our, we had our edges. You know, so here's, here's kind of a poignant and painful story. As she aged, I felt we really resolved a lot. We really came to some kind of peace, especially when I had my daughter. All of a sudden, I saw her as a grandmother, and she was so wise. And I thought, oh, maybe our conflict had to do with me, too. Because look at her. She's, she's a wonderful person. <laughs> no. So it was, no, no, no. So, but then as she aged and started losing her cognitive ground, she forgot we resolved it. 
<laughs> which is pain, painful and poignant. And I just had to let go. I had to let go and just be with our relationship. But at, here in Boulder, she ended up having a, a very amazing, supported um, ending to her life. So two, like six weeks before she died, we were at Daddy Bruce's, or not Daddy Bruce's, Big Daddy's. Big Daddy? Some daddy, having bagels somewhere. <laughs> and all of a sudden she said, I feel peaceful and magnificent. And I just looked at her. So her peacefulness, her acceptance, her... And then a, 10 days before she died, she was singing Hey Jude on the unit. So anyway, I just wanted to share how this model you know, can come into our lives and can support, how we can support each other and those we love in all these ways. And it has to do with this relational medicine and creating these environments for people to just relax and be themselves and face whatever challenges are arising in their life. So I'd like to say just a few words about some of the fundamental principles of this approach. And this applies no matter what population you're working with. <laughs> You know that guy. I know. <laughs> anyway, um, so as you, this is, I'm speaking to the choir here, I think, but the fundamental principles are, the first one is um, that people are fundamentally sane and healthy, and if there's any confusion, if there's any illness, if there's any, um, any of that, the secondary to this fundamental basic basic ground of sanity and healthiness. So this is what we feel, you know, in our work, you know, and how we relate to our, each other and um, our clients. And then also that mind and environment are interchange. They're very much interconnected and interdependent and affect one another. You know, there's this resonance. So those two principles are really manifest in, in how we conduct our teams, how we create environments, how we regard the people we work with, our fellow practitioners, plus our so-called clients. And also that the um, that we're grounded in this contemplative view, you know, and the contemplative view having to do with um, reflect, having times of self-reflection and working on ourselves. And so, um, how can I say this so it doesn't sound like a pat answer in some ways. This model grew out of the contemplative view and the possibility that we can actually befriend ourselves in a very intimate way and make friends with ourselves and then thereby then being able to be compassionate with others. And in, in this process of befriending ourselves, we're we're suffering as well. We're, things are coming up, we don't like that, oh, I have to look at that, and that is me, and how do I make friends with that? So the more we can do that with ourselves, the more we can be kind of an open, um, receptive ear person, you know, for other. And so we really, this is very, this is ground level, and this is in whatever client population you're working with, this is what we foster and encourage. Um, in our staff, you know, and this is part of the vision of the whole of the work altogether. This population that we work with here in elder care is um, because there are these two organizations in town. We have, I guess, kind of arbitrarily cut off this number at 65. You know, we receive referrals uh, 65 and older, and those dying of any age. So we've had teams for people that are dying in their, in their 20s as well. Or we work with people with more medical challenges, um, you know, coming out of a rehab. We can also create some teams. But we've also got an expertise here in working with um, so-called geriatric, psychiatric folks. Mm -hmm. And so, and we were just at a caregiver's symposium, and there was a doctor who we befriended, a woman, I think a new, young woman doctor in town, I forget her name, Geiger? Geiger, Dr. Geiger, and she came to our table and she mentioned to some of us at the table, Emily was there I think, and she said, you're the gold standard in town for care for the elderly, so, which was really great to hear and affirms, you know, we don't, we don't feel we're competitive or like we want, we got to be the gold, you know, go for the gold. <laughs> but. But this is the, the feedback we're getting, you know, from people is that they really, um, they notice the qualities of our care. Um, 
as, compo as compared to, and not to, not to be um, disparaging of any home care, health care agencies, but there, we focus on the relationship, and we, we aren't as um, task driven, you know, as, you know, and of course, some situations you have a task, you have so many clients, you have to f perform these things. So, welcome, Blake. <laughs> He's sneaking in. <laughs> Good, good, thank you. <laughs> so, and also just to say uh, that Windhorst is a holistic and integrated approach, and what I mean by that is that we look at a person's whole life. So, again, it's that broad view of um, an individual and who they are and what they're coming to us in terms of the needs that they have. So, so you could say in the traditional medical reference world, it's physical, psychological, social. And then in the Eastern view, we talk about um, body, speech, and mind. And we actually do a lot of teachings about body, speech, and mind. And it's, and it's expanded, there are expansions on each of those areas. And so now we'd like to take you into our world with elders and those dying and flesh out each of those areas and get a taste of what that's like at this level of um, experience and um, attending them, so. So we'll begin with Stephanie speaking to the aspects of mind. Body. 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 <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're related, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks, Emily, thank you, Kathy, for that intro. Um, and thank you all for being here. I feel so honored and really blessed to be able to be part of this panel and to share all this with all of you, I mean, some people who I've worked with for years, some people I'm working more closely with now, and just really close, um, long-time friends, and of course my husband as well. So, <laughs> it feels really special. Um, you know, when I was reflecting on this presentation, I felt like this, I told Polly this, I felt like I had this great sense of real appreciation and gratitude for this, the work that we do. Um, you know, as a Windhorse team, I feel like we really bear witness to others' suffering. And if we're open, we bear witness to our own suffering as well. As Kathy likes to say, and she has said this several times, which I find really helpful, is that we go towards the challenge. Uh, we lean into it instead of turning away, which is, you know, sometimes our habit. And doing this really takes a lot of courage as well. Um, so I want to appreciate that as well. We really allow experiences to arise and we try not to judge them or invest in them. Um, we're having to continuously really work with our minds through self-reflection. And I feel like really a pivotal part of the Windhorse approach is self-reflection. Um, our teacher, Zygar Kontrabimche, uh, says, self-reflection is the spirit of taking interest in what we normally would push away. Um, today I'm going to talk about that body aspect, which refers to, of course, the physical body, uh, the environment, relationships. Uh, but I found it challenging to prepare for this um, for many reasons. One is there's just so much information, you know, that, to share, and we want to hear from all of you as well. Um, I'd like to focus on the uh, begin focusing on the essence of the Windhorst approach, which is. Um, I find interesting, and in I was looking at our job description for basic attenders, and in there is the 10 skills of basic attendance. Um, and it's just like a very human um, duties that we're expected to perform, basically, as basic attenders. Um, and these skills are really, I feel like, the guiding principles of the work we do. Uh, first and foremost, we try um, to develop a deep compassion for our clients. Um, and we really open ourselves to their experience. Uh, this is referred to the skill of letting in. Um, and I think through the practice of self-reflection, we try to put ourselves in their shoes, so to speak, um, and think about like how would we want to be given, how would we want to be treated in any given situation. And sometimes they're pretty humorous situations, and we'll get into some of that. Um, we try to really remain open and allow ourselves to be touched, you know, by the experience. Um, and we're all about like building relationship and trust, you know, when we're working with our elders. 
Um, we try to attune to the energy, um, to their energy and their needs. And we try to bring humor in wherever we can as well, because we find that really important. Uh, often we talk about <laughs> how we could have like a, a sitcom, you know, with all the different things that go on, you know, in our meetings, you know, on shifts sometimes. And reality Michael, TV. yeah, like a reality TV show. Michael, we thought we would hire you to maybe start <laughs> filming some of this. Um, we have a good time. Uh, so in order to really be able to um, get in there with folks, we have to be present. And we hear about this all the time, you know, um, being present. And what does that mean? Um, so um, Rimche wrote a book called It's Up To You, Zagar Kulcha Rimche, and he said, being present doesn't mean being in a blank or a thoughtless state. It means not needing to escape from where we are. Being present brings contentment. We don't have to look for a better thought, a better emotion, better weather, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, when we're present, we're really able to, I feel, respond and really attune um, to our clients. We have to drop our own agenda, um, for sure, at times, and try to be less task-oriented, which I don't know about you guys, but that's pretty hard for me. <laughs> um, but I think we have to do that in order to be present. Uh, I think the skill of being present is really just coming back over and over again. You know, we work with clients who tend to loop um, sometimes, you know, ask us the same questions, talk about the same thing. I'm sure we can relate to that. And, you know, we have to really try to stay present. And so when I think about that, like I think about like coming back to the breath, you know, when we're meditating, because um, you can easily get distracted when you're with someone who's looping a lot. So there's that connection to the contemplative practice as well. Um, so often, you know, our clients with dementia, they have cognitive uh, or verbal challenges. Sometimes they're not able to communicate. So it becomes like this energetic dance that, uh, that's the way I like to think of it, um, that we engage in, because we're trying to like skillfully navigate like what they need when they're not really able to like communicate what their needs are. So because we're in relationship and we're familiar with one another, um, we're able to like, you know, sense their body language and we can intuitively, you know, tune into what they need. And we have to be careful about our body language as well because if we're rushed or we feel stressed <laughs> or pressured, you know, they're, they're sensitive to that. They're very perceptive so they can feel that as well. So it's important that we're mindful of that. Um, I love this. I took this quote from Vicki Howard in one of her writings, and it said, we have to relax into being rather than doing. And that's so true. Um, so when we are present, um, we're able to engage in this skill called letting be. And this is really, I feel like, letting go of, like I said, our agenda or what we think should possibly happen on a shift working with clients, um, and really just stay open to whatever arises. And Joe T likes to say, and I love this, the task is in service to the relationship. Um, and you know, what we do is all relational. So um, I think we have to be flexible and fluid in every moment. Um, a good example of this is that um, I was working with an elder and I was helping her get dressed and she wears Depends. And this woman, someone here knows very dearly, um, you know, we were talking and I was trying to help her and I realized I, she, her, she, didn't, she didn't have any Depends on and she always wears Depends. So I got nervous because I didn't know where they were. And so I was trying to stay present because she was telling me this really important story, but I was kind of frantically <laughs> looking around the room trying to find the Depends. Couldn't find them, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna let it go. So we went into the other room, I made her breakfast. I kind of forgot about it, came back an hour later, and I found them hanging on a standing lamp like this. <laughs> and I thought, okay, it's a, this is all right. I'm glad I found them, you know. Um, but yeah, it's stuff like that that comes up. Um, anyway, <laughs> so um, as much as we want it to let it be, you know, we have to also lean in at times. And um, good segue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, another story about this same client. Um, you know, you know, leaning in. You have to be really skillful, and you know, sometimes it's best not to. So, um, but sometimes we have to. Like, you know, if a PT prescribes like certain exercises to do, you know, we have to lean in and encourage them to do those exercises. Or um, if they should continue to walk to be able to stay mobile as long as possible, we have to lean in and, you know, encourage them to walk. Um, sometimes we have to encourage them to, you know, brush their teeth, change their clothes, and take showers. I was working with this woman who hadn't showered in weeks, and her family was really, you know, wanting her to shower. So I thought, all right, what, how are we going to do this? You know, what am I going to do? And so I, she has a great sense of humor, this woman. And so I thought, I'm going to bring my bathing suit. You know, and I'm just going to like jump in the shower with her, you know, and see how that goes. And so I did, and um, it went really well. Like, it, she like, there was, you know, like by bringing humor into the situation, she relaxed, she laughed the whole time, you know, and it ended up being such a different experience for her because, you know, she doesn't like taking showers. It doesn't feel good, you know? Her skin is sensitive. So anyway, I became the shower lady. And that was all I did, basically, um, for a couple years, um, once a week. So, um, yeah. But, <laughs> I didn't shampoo my own hair, but I could have. Um, anyway. So we also, you know, speaking of body, you know, physical environment's really important. You know, we try to um, create like a familiar environment for our folks, one that's, you know, um, uplifted and simple um, as much as we can. Um, it's really, you know, important to create a safe, obviously comfortable environment. We try to get as creative as we can. Um, and the skill of bringing home, you know, what we try to do is we try to create purpose and meaning, you know, in their lives um, as much as possible. We ask them to help us with the cooking and the cleaning and the laundry and whatever they normally would have done in the past. You know, we engage them in those kind of activities um, as well. So they feel like they have a sense of control, purpose, and meaning. Um, we also uh, find energy, which is another skill by utilizing objects uh, to stimulate their senses, like aromatherapy or touch therapy, massage, um, flower arranging, dance, mo uh, movement. One woman we work with, she's doing silent discos now. Oh, yeah. I know. I was like, I want to do that when I get to be that age. <laughs> um, anyway, you can get really creative. So... Um, in addition, we try to, you know, uh, encourage people to take care of, um, you know, their animals, gardens, flowers. Another story about our great friend. Um, she, uh, you know, was always wanting to go home, always wanting to go to work. She was a CU professor. She lives close to CU. She was always on the move. And we had a hard time containing her, so to speak, in her home because she always wanted to go. Um, so one day I had the door open and we were getting some fresh air and this cat came walking in and I was like, where did this cat come from? And you know, this per I'm just gonna say NH, um, was so excited you know, to see this cat. And so I took the cat out and we <coughs> left the door open and the cat came in again. And I was like, what's up with this cat? So I took the cat out and then the cat came in again. And I thought, this is interesting, like they have some sort of connection here. So the cat got up into her lap and she was just like, you know, just mm -hmm. loved it. And um, come to find out, you know, I looked at the, the tag, I called the owner and the owner's like, actually, Mark is looking for a new home. So if you want to adopt him, you know, we would love that. And so um, Tracy was the housemate at the time, so she could totally relate to all of us. Um, and so NH ended up adopting Mark. And it brought so much, um, just so much like purpose to her life. And she stopped wanting to go home. She stopped wanting to go to work because she was so content 
being at home because she had something to care for. And she thought Mark was a, a girl, right? And she thought um, it was her, I think a child or student. I wasn't sure, it didn't matter. Mark was great and she still has Mark to this day. I don't know how many years later, um, Mark moved to, an assist, or to a memory care unit with her. And she, you know, she loves Mark and Mark loves her. And now Mark is getting all this attention from like 30 other residents, you know? <laughs> So it worked out well. Um, another skill of basic attendance, which I find really fascinating and really inspiring about this work is learning. Um, I feel like the practice of basic attendance really becomes a means of one's personal path and development. You know, we, I feel like we really allow ourselves to be touched by our experiences if we have an open heart and we can learn so much, you know, from others. And about, we can learn so much about ourselves, you know, our attachments, our neurosis, where we're stuck. Um, and I feel like this really helps us just have much, you know, a greater sense of love and acceptance towards ourselves and others. Sorry. Which for me has been like, sense of the mutual recovery that we talk about. Now I'm going to talk about dying, which <laughs> I'm already crying. So. <laughs> um, so we also help people, you know, during their dying process. And, um, oh, okay, thanks. This is obviously, you know, one of the most challenging experiences I think we've all been in. Um, with our clients, you know, often we get so attached and so there's some sense of denial there as well. Um, I can at least speak for myself. But if we remain open um, to this experience, thank you. I feel like we learn so much. And then if we can relax with someone during this process, it really helps them relax as well. Um, and it can be quite supportive. And then they don't feel so isolated and alone through the process. So, the truth is we fall in love with our clients. And they become our family. And this is really the discovery of love and friendship, I feel. You know, we become deeply connected and close, you know, not only to the client, but to the families. We become a family. And um, I feel like this approach really, you know, um, I feel like we get so much out of working with elders. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Perfect. Um, I feel like, personally, I get so much more um, than I'm really able to give. I feel like we're really, um, we are the receivers of the love and the care um, than the givers, so much more than the givers. So, thank you. Yeah. everything you just expressed and, and for the way that you expressed it. Um, it's so obvious um, how deep in your bones this work has become, like every cell of your body. And I know that's folks in the audience who work with elders feel that too. Um, um, so now, Jody, we um, will be speaking to us about the aspects of speech, um, including relationship and communication. Does this actually work? It's just for the recording. Oh, so I'm going to have to talk loud? Yeah, or just put it close to you. Either way. But yeah, the people in the room, they, they're only going to be your, okay. your actual voice. All, all right, way. all right. Hi. I really loved the sound of that thunder a little bit earlier. So I'm going to ask it to come back. Um, Kathy and Emily mentioned that 
I came to this work through a loss. And I said a little bit about that on Thursday night, but I want to talk about someone named John at the beginning of what I talk about, and then another person named John at the end. So I have two Johns in my heart right now. Um, the first was my fiance, and I was 35 years old when he came into my life. Um, no, I was 34 when he came into my life and 35 years old when he died. And he was such a good man. He, he had this beautiful balance of strength and vulnerability, but mainly he had kindness. He was a kind man. And um, he had asthma, he had severe asthma. And one night he was beginning to have an attack and we drove to the hospital and he um, had a cardiac arrest while I was holding his hand and they couldn't bring him back. Um, and so it was after John's very sudden <laughs> and unexpected death that the reality of death um, was something I could no longer ignore. I couldn't push it away anymore. It was right here. And I wouldn't know it then, but that moment would change my life and really lead me on so many amazing paths through a monastery in Oklahoma who had a connection to Naropa and then to Naropa and then to Windhorse. Um, and most elders that we've been, that we work with have been contemplating death for years and maybe even decades. It's, I should put my glasses on. <laughs> it, it isn't something far away. It's, it could be now at any moment. And with that knowledge can come a deeper joy and humility. And it brings about what's important in life, which I think boils down to love, which all of us are talking about today, really. Um, and I wanted to be around people who knew this and to offer something back. And eventually I came to know that I did have something to offer back, which is that I wouldn't turn away. Um, my heart had been broken open in a way that I had never known before. And out of that brokenness came a gift that I could offer and then receive back in countless ways. And so the path, this path opened the door to authentic connection and community and intimacy. And um, what I love about working in teams is, is working with people in a circle who have such bravery and courage and willingness to face old age and sickness and death um, squarely in the eye without turning away, like you were saying. And like you were saying. Um, so, in the 20 years of working with elders and people dying, I've become an elder myself. I'm becoming an elder myself. Um, at 63, I get out of the bed more slowly in the morning. And my joints ache. My memory isn't what it used to be, which people are beginning to notice. <laughs> I tell myself it's because I have too much on my mind. And if I don't write it down, it's going to be gone forever. And I can't see anything without my glasses, except that I did really big font. <laughs> I contemplate old age and death almost on a daily basis. And I wonder who I am now that my roles are fading away. Um, and even as new roles are rising, I'm a nana now. And I have four beautiful granddaughters. Grand Three granddaughters, one grandson. Um, I wonder if my life has made a difference and if I'll be missed when I'm gone. And these are the questions that face so many of the people we work with. They want to know if their time here has been worth something. And they want to know if they've been a good person and if they'll be missed and if their life has mattered. And it's the state of mind most of us will face if we live long enough. So I'm going to take a drink of water. And we're going to do a little experiential now.
And Stephanie's going to get it started, and I'm going to end with a few questions. Okay, this is something actually Polly shared with me a few years ago. Oh, sure. Okay, the intention of this exercise is to offer the opportunity to experience being present rather than doing. We are attempting to relax our tendency to accomplish or focus on goal-oriented activity. Being is always available to us. It is simply a matter of recognizing this energy and tuning into it. So go ahead and find a comfortable position in your chair. Place your feet flat on the floor if possible. Straight back, eyes are open with a downward soft gaze, not focused on anything in particular. <clears throat> Feel the weight of gravity holding your body down. Feel the support of the chair beneath you. Tune into your body in general and notice any physical sensations you may be having. Are you feeling a sense of tiredness? Is your back hurting? How does your stomach feel? Are you hungry? Hope not. How is your breathing? Take a minute and simply bring your attention to the body. We all came here today carrying things. We care for our families, friends, clients, and our community. We have responsibilities. We have accumulated credentials which qualify us to do the work we do. Just for this time, let's put that all aside. Try to let it all go. Let go of doing and tune into simply being here. This might be a vis visual experience or a feeling of letting go, shifting your position to be more relaxed than the chair or just tuning into the body and the breath. As you feel the weight of your body and your sense of rootedness in your chair, notice the environment, the sounds in the room, the presence of others near you. Turn your attention to your mental activity, your thoughts, your feelings, and then look at the stream of thoughts and feelings and mental events as they arise, the river of your experience. Hold your awareness of your physical body, the environment around you, and the stream of mental activity. Hold the awareness for a few minutes, noticing the currents. Now go ahead and let go. Please close your eyes, and Jody has a few questions for you to contemplate. If you live long enough to become an elder, what kind of elder do you hope to be?
What kind of elder do you fear you'll be? Death can come at any time without warning. What kind of death do you hope to have? What kind of death do you fear you'll have? And what about your legacy and love? What kind of legacy do you hope for? What are your fears around leaving legacy and love behind? No matter your age, do you contemplate these questions? If so, how often? So when you're ready, open your eyes and come back into the room. How was that for you? Does anyone have anything they would like to share right now? We'll have more time at the end. So in facing these questions that we've just com contemplated, the wind horse model is such a perfect fit for helping these elders walk this path towards the unknown and towards death. And while most of the work with elders out in the world is really task-oriented, like Stephanie was saying, um, we do all the tasks in service to the relationship. Most importantly, this model cultivates the ability to feel compassion and empathy and even the strongest medicine, which is love. And I just said the L word, and I'm going to say it a few more times. <laughs> um, the best medicine, really, the best relational medicine is love. And whenever we put teams together, Kate knows about this, well, we all do, um, we look for people that have the possibility of understanding and compassion and patience and skill. But most importantly, will there be the possibility of love? Will we come to love a person who is slipping away into old age and death, who is sometimes cranky, often disoriented, and occasionally smelly? Who is afraid and whose mind and body is falling apart? Will we allow ourselves to be touched so deeply that we'll grieve when they're gone? We were doing an assessment for an 85-year-old a few weeks ago. I think that was you, Michelle. And um, she was going through her list of ailments. And finally, she stopped and just said, listen, what I have is creeping decrepitude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you laughed. <laughs> and there's really nothing sexy about creeping decrepitude. <laughs> There's nothing to perk your ears up about or try to find a treatment or a cure or any possibility of recovery. It's pretty much the slow process of decline. And um, if we live long enough, it's the diagnosis all of us will face. And there's no escape other than early death. And whether early or late, death comes. So these are the realities we work with and that our clients teach us about. But what we can do is let it in. And letting in, as Stephanie talked about, is one of the 10 skills of basic attendance. And it, when, when it comes to working with old age and death, that letting in requires a particular kind of courage. Um, unlike other ailments, which we can kind of conceptualize and say, well, I don't have cancer, I don't have schizophrenia, I don't have whatever disease, um, I haven't been diagnosed with this or that, I will die. Um, knowing this truth and letting it in can help remove the barriers to working with others and 
really bring that suffering into our own hearts because someday it will be our own suffering. Um, because death, as we know, is the one great equalizer and it's the thing that we all have in common. So, I'm more of a storyteller than teacher. Um, so I'm gonna end with a story about another John. And um, he was 90 years old. He was 88 when I began working with him. And that was almost three years ago. He was grumpy and fiery and mad about almost everything. He was mad about the way his kids took my car away <laughs> and the way the people at the facilities treated him and the way he couldn't just go back home. But mostly, I think he was mad that his body was turning on him. Um, his complaints manifested in things that he had control over, or at least he thought he did. Uh, Lou Stinger, who many of you know, also worked with him. And we both heard the same story over and over and over about the car situation, which he called the transportation issue. <laughs> <laughs> I'd come in, hi John, how you doing today? Well, Jody, I want to talk to you about that transportation issue. <laughs> and off we go. <laughs> and I, if I have favorite clients to work with, and I confess I do, it's grumpy old men. <laughs> I seem to know the way around their, the big lions they have guarding the gates. <laughs> and I found a way in with John. He ha I sure need some water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, he had countless stories that I loved listening to over and over and over most of the time and they were about his family and his work and his life and he was from Virginia I've been practicing that and I still can't get it right <laughs> who's from the south here can you say it for me Virginia <laughs> that was it And I learned that Virginia was a state that was quite apart from every other, and it, you couldn't even be from Northern Virginia. You had to be from Southern Virginia. Oh. Right? Well, to really? Yankee, if you're from Northern Virginia. Oh, oh got go. it, okay. Yankees. <laughs> Yank, those Yankees. <laughs> um, he worked as an engineer for a peanut mill his whole career, <clears throat> and was known as Big John. Apparently, one of his th favorite things to do was to put his new hires through all kinds of tasks which were impossible to accomplish. <clears throat> and his, his employees feared him, but mostly they loved him. And when he retired, he wrote this short, sweet letter. Dear George, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be gone from 43 years of service to the company on June 3rd, 1998. <coughs> Kindly give me my car and a tank of gas as a parting gift. This year's bonus would be appreciated too, and of course, benefits. Things are going to be a real mess here without me. <laughs> but I'll consult from time to time out of the kindness of my generous nature. Oh. <laughs> that, was, that was his latest joke, of course. He was married 67 years, had two children, a son and a daughter, and lifelong friends. His best friend's nickname was Mouse, and he had known Mouse since the third grade. He was man of duty and honor, and he was deeply chivalrous. He voted for Obama twice and despised Trump, <clears throat> and could talk about politics till the cows came home. <laughs> And that was my expression, but I so wish he was here so I could run that one by him. <laughs> there were also many, many moments of deep vulnerability. He grieved the death of his wife a few years before his own death. He shared many stories of their life together and often shed tears. Discovering friendship is another of the 10 skills, and John and I did that together. I looked forward to seeing him. He was always ready to talk, and before time was over, 
we would share not only tears, but big laughs, big, big belly laughs, most of the time. Sometimes he was just grumpy, and I loved, the, I loved it that he could get angry with me and yell, Jody, what are you talking about? <laughs> or, God damn it, stop interrupting me. <laughs> I could give it right back to him too, <laughs> which he loved. He complained <clears throat> often and long about things, and while I tried to find skillful ways, sometimes I would not so skillfully interrupt him, and he would just look at me and kind of like, like, I can't believe you're interrupting me again. <laughs> Despite his progressive views about politics, some of his views were outdated. He felt that it was his daughter's duty to take care of him. His son was too busy working, and of course his what better did his daughter have to do than to take care of him and his wife? And he, like I said, he was a man of duty and he viewed, he viewed that as her duty. And she would fume if she heard this again, and rightly so. But his daughter did take care of him and her mom here in Boulder for almost 10 years because he taught her well. And she has his integrity and indomitable spirit. But it has taken a toll on her. If there was a reason John was here on this earth, it was to fight. He fought the good fight, he fought life, and ultimately he fought death and everything in between. <laughs> right down to the way his coffee was delivered every morning. And it better be delivered and it better be warm, and it better be on time. Even though it wasn't their job to deliver his coffee. Um, and then there were willing doctors around him helping, helping him fight that death, including the doctor who talked him into a pacemaker a few months before he died. Um, his daughter found a fitting quote. It's a, it's a paragraph from Being Mortal. If, ha if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. The simple view is that medicine exists to fight death and disease, and that is, of course, its most basic task. Death, death is the enemy, but the enemy has superior forces. Eventually it wins, and in a war you cannot win, you don't want a general who fights to the point of total annihilation, you don't want Custer, you want Robert E. Lee, someone knows, who knows how to fight for territory that can be won and how to surrender when it can't. Someone who understands that the damage is greatest if all you do is battle to the bitter end. His daughter thought that reference to Robert E. Lee would resonate with her dad. And we both read that book and tried to help him find a way to relax into the fact that his body was truly giving out, but that acceptance never quite came. He just wasn't interested in giving up the fight. One of the last things he said to me was he's, he was lying on his deathbed was, we never did figure out that transportation issue. <laughs> He had a faded twinkle in his eye when he said it. And he clearly saw the futility of it. But um, he was letting me in on something really important, which is that he recognized and accepted that he was dying and that he found humor in it all, <laughs> which was, it felt like his own form of acceptance. Ultimately, his body gave out last November, and I came to see the sanity in his way. He was still trying to figure things out till the day he died. Recognizing sanity is another of the 10 skills, and it wasn't always easy with John, but if I looked closely enough, I would find it. He was a brave warrior on the battlefield of life. He lived and died his own way, not anyone else's, and he was someone I admired and respected and loved. And the last of the 10 skills I'll talk about is learning. 
From John, I learned life is worth the fight. You can be old and worn out, but you don't have to give up, ever. And you can be battle-scarred from life, but you can still purr with delight like an old lion. And in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. There's a poem about an old lion that um, his daughter-in-law wrote for him that speaks so beautifully to who he was. And um, I hope you found a little love in your heart for both the Johns I talked about today. <laughs> you highlight so beautifully the invitation that we have in this model for real relationship and real love. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Kathy will be speaking to mind. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Jody and Stephanie. This is, this is so poignant. And this Kathy, is really you. poignant. We have about oh. 25 minutes in total. Oh, okay. Yes. Quick mind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Flash, did you all get it? <laughs> just gave you a Trans yeah. transmission. Yeah. yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll be good. I'll be succinct. Uh, mind, mind, what an area. What is mind anyway? You know, there are all the different traditions talk about regard mind in different ways. I think when we think of elders, um, we think of losing our mind, we think of aging, and then how is, how is our mind affected cognitively, you know, but there, there are different views of mind. I think in the Buddhist tradition, mind is heart and brain, you know, it's, and spirit, it's not just here. But um, there is a reality about the structural aspect of mind that can be affected, and so we become, we have challenges there. And so, I, I just wanted to um, point to that, you know, and it's interesting that, um, well, the folks that we work with, we work with a range of functioning, you know, mind abilities. So we can have some folks who are frail, frail elderlies and they're pretty much um, oriented and they're not having cognitive issues, but then we work with the, con you know, the full continuum of, um, Dementia, early early onset Alzheimer's, late stage Alzheimer's, and to death. You know, vascular dementia. We work with a whole range of mind functioning, and it's interesting. I guess if I think of Windhorst Community Services and Windhorst Elder Care, it's and the mind. These are extreme mind states, and and as Jody was saying, in this territory, you know, like with your bodies, it's like you can't say, I don't want this diagnosis of my body falling apart. And it's, I guess it's similar with your mind, but I'm actually hearing myself say this, and I'm going to say something contradicting it. Because we, we've received teachings from amazing teachers, um, some of which, and Zegar Contro seems to be coming up quite a bit today, but the wisdom teachers. Um, Polly, actually, and I were on a team for a woman who was diagnosed with, uh, Polly, the director of Winters Community Services right now. <laughs> I just want to name that. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> but anyway, we were on this team together, and this woman um, was in her 50s, and she was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. And I remember we consulted with Zigar Control about her she had an amazing presence. She, she was very wakeful, and she, was loose. she had what was called atypical dementia. And she was on a clinical trial for certain medicines, you know, trying out memantine or nemenda or whatever it's called. As it turned out, they had the diagnosis wrong, but um, she received that diagnosis, and, and she had a brain condition. And so when we consulted with him, he, he said, you're real... Um, your realization is not touched by your cognitive functioning. So you can have what maybe from the outside, we we've see a person and they look like their mind is completely gone and on certain, some level it, maybe it is, but their spirit, their realization, they're, they're there, you know, that isn't touched. So it's not, that's not in a, just a cognitive realm of functioning. And then Ntrangu Rinpoche has also said that the sense faculties and mental processes are affected, but the underlying Buddha nature is unchanged. So, I mean, that could be kind of a way to 
make us feel better <laughs> about because anticipating losing your mind or even as family members and being with family members who are having these challenges, it's uh, very hard. It's very challenging. It can be even horrifying. You know, and just the thought of our own cognitive decline, the anticipatory piece of it. But who's to know? Who's to know what it's like in that state? You know, so just to create that possibility of, um, and I trust these teachers. I, I have some, I don't surrender my intelligence to them, but, I, but there's a wisdom, there are wisdom traditions that I, I trust and inform me, you know. And, and so there's this fundamental, this speaks to the fundamental sanity as one of the initial principles, you know, of our work. And this is what we, um, and this is an antidote to the cultural, there's a cultural bias in our society against elders and against, and for people losing their minds and, you know, their functioning. So I feel, and I'm losing my train of thought here, which is, again, experiential demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to look at these notes and talk at the same time. There's a tremendous amount of hope and fear around losing your mind. Let's just say it. It's true. <laughs> it's true. And then I wanted to bring up another teaching um, by Zigar Kontrol called Lenchuk, L-E-N-C-H-A-K. And this has to do with attachment. And it's, it's, it's not like uh, the teachings, the Western teachings you hear about early bonding and attachment and all of that. This is fundamental attachment that we all have to ourselves, to our thoughts, to our loved ones, to our materials, to our ideologies. You know, this is like fundamental attachment issues. And so this, this fear of losing our minds, it's like penetrates to such a deep place, you know, because we're so attached to our identity, and our identity has to do with some self-reflection of who we are in any given moment and how we function in the world. So maybe I won't say a whole lot more since we're running out of time. We want to hear from you all. Um, one last quote um, from um, His Holiness um, Ken Rinpoche, and he said that the aging process is, um, presents us with a choice. And the choice is to go towards vast mind or petty mind. Mm -hmm. And you can just see how the, the level of disability and dysfunction you know, that we go through if you do age in this process and don't die earlier, the opportunities are there all the time. Am I going to open up? This has been a theme for this weekend that I've really noted and lived by, try to live by, that we have all these challenges in our life and there's always the opportunity to open up or to close down, tighten up. And of course, we're gonna do that. We're gonna breathe in and out of those places. It's not like we once we're open, we're open and that's it and we've arrived and whoopee, everything's easy. No, it's, it's, an, it's a process, but it, it's just really gave me a template for, um, and a phrase you know, for, for the challenge and the wisdom p potential as we age. So that's all I'll say. Thank you so much. It's all so poignant. Really appreciate you taking the time to share, um, and yeah, we want to open it up to the to you all now with questions and um, opportunity for you to share stories and comments. Um, I'll bring a microphone. Well, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, just I love the stories. I think that. Um, through that kind of sharing and heartfelt stories, we really uh, try start to understand, you know, what you're talking about from the perspective of how the view of Windhors can really serve in all these different, you know, age ranges. And I, you know, I was thinking about the person Kathy, you and I worked with, um, through the what she was going through. At the time, we didn't know it was not Alzheimer's, but there's this notion of um, her not having access to her mind in some ways, but when music came on, yes. that she just like woke up. And um, in reflecting on the questions that you were asking Jyoti about, you know, how much do we reflect on our own death and what's the, where is the fear, um, you know, based on what we th want th to happen versus what do we fear is gonna happen. I think those are so poignant, and I really actually, whether I like it or not, these thoughts come to my, my mind very, very regularly. And, um, the, and you know, having that put in context, I really appreciate. So I guess what I'm wondering, 
and if you could talk about is um, just this quality of the, the awake that you notice in your clients. How, like what, um, you know, Steph, you talked about the, the body aspect where um, you can connect in certain ways and, and you really see where this uh, awareness and awakeness is. And I, I was curious if you could address that a little bit more of like when you notice that and w what that has as an impact on your mind. so many ways and um, so unique to each person that we work with. Um, what wakeful means. Um, yeah, the, there's a um, client's family member here in the room and I have been holding that client with me through the presentation and for him, wakeful moments often mean um, direct eye contact, um, acknowledging maybe something that's on my face an expression, um, humor. Um, and for others, um, the wakeful quality can be sort of counterintuitive. Like for some people, it might mean feeling really relaxed mm -hmm. um, rather than energized or clear of mind or having a um, what we call an island of clarity. Um, it can look more like a moment where they're really surrendered to what's happening in their body and um, able to let go. Um, yeah, so many things. Your example about client N with her cat, you know, just moments where um, elders who are confused cognitively have just love shine through. Um, mm -hmm. is such a poignant panel. <laughs> um, you know, I've been thinking about my mom. You know, of course, this brings up, uh, you know, just elders in general, where I am in my life. I, my mom just turned 89 in February. And Kathy, you were talking about getting a team for your mom, you know, and um, right now we have a, sort of an organic, natural team of my family, which has been a, a beautiful thing, um, horrific at times, of course, um, as you can imagine. But I'm wondering, when I think about getting help uh, from outside, and I've, I've talked to Stephanie, you know, a lot, and how, how do you work, I, I guess the question is, how do you work with families, but in particular, what comes up in my own mind is kind of a horror. I love my mother very much, but I also know her feistiness and just how horrible it can be. And I think my biggest kind of, that's not the biggest fear, but I come up with this embarrassment myself that is, you know, kind of like being a teenager when it's like, oh no, here she goes. And being, you know, I don't want my friends to see my mom in this particular way because it's so intimate. Do you know what I mean? So I'm wondering, you know, with all of you, how do you work with the families and the kind of, it, I think it takes a, a level of humility to let someone take care of your parent because you, you know how bad it can get and how great it can get. But, you know, my mom, whoo. <laughs> so, can you talk about the families a little bit? you know, and that aspect of it, when they're feisty? That's a beautiful question. I, I'd like to add to the question um, something around, like if you want to speak to something around family role reversal, which is yeah. such a big part of this process, and um, the family history coming is all there. It's all present when we're working with our elder parents. She has a PhD, so she's like, and she'll let you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's Dr. Kari. <laughs> Oh, sure. Well, just to add to that. Sure. I mean, the other yeah, just the you know, know when you have the daughter from hell. Right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have some family stuff, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The daughter that loves their parents. Right. 
right. Like, yeah. and we'll and do anything, anything for their career. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. right. Uh, including telling you how to do your job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we run into that a lot as well. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's so poignant, isn't it? I mean, I'm assuming, so it sounds like your mom is losing ground? Not cognitively. Oh, not cognitively. Oh, OK. But uh, she's aging, she's, so she's. Well, she's blind oh. from back of the degeneration. Oh. That came on very quickly. Oh. And wow. it's also, her hearing is really not great. So her ability wow. to communicate and to see. Yeah. And it's very frightening that she, yeah. she'll tell everybody. I don't know if you know this, but I'm legally blind. Oh. I'm not yeah. sure if you know this. Yeah. But I was back in the <laughs> generation. Oh. I mean, it, it will be, and it's not from cognitive, it's just, it, she's trying, I think, to. Losing her uh, orientation, losing her reference points. Yeah. You know, when you have your sense perceptions <clears throat> affected like that, it brings you inside. You know, if you're, especially if you're visually, we're all visually oriented, some more than others. But if those are kind of your anchor points or that's how you meet the world, now you have to go in here. And if you can't hear, it's like you're really in here. Yeah. You know, just in terms of having more compassion for her being a hostage, she's like a held hostage with her maybe unresolved spirit that's working through stuff inside her body. It's like all here. And you could say it's a karmic ripening. It is for all of us, you know, however it unfolds. But so I, I would say take care of yourself. I, I don't think it's time for heroics in terms of like, I'm going to work this through with my mom and I'll be right there and take all her abuse or whatever, you know, because things get dicey, you know, as you're saying, that can be hor horrible. So you have and create more bad feelings and maybe karma and difficult interactions. But you have these teams, you know, and what the teams can do is they can provide support, the more intimacy support, and then you can be the daughter at a distance that feels workable and comf not, not comfortable is maybe the wrong word, but manageable for you and your spirit and your being. And you can, I'm sure you get your support for yourself outside, you know, from others, therapy, or whatever, friends, Stephanie, you know. But it, it really, it's like, almost like the ultimate challenge is how do we, can we resolve these intimate, attached relationships with the Lynchuk, like, raging, you know, attachment, and how do we make friends with, with ourselves and others and love each other and wish them well on their journey, which I'm sure you feel. But it's, we, we've had family, we've had systems where we have the team and the daughter coming to our team, mem team meetings, then the daughter and the family and in a very challenged family situation. And what we found there is that what we were working through in our team meetings, like with each other, was having an effect. This is the family systems, like reverberation of the karma, you know, support and unfolding in the work. Mm -hmm. You know, how the teams, the family system and the team system can actually provide medicine. Yeah. The team can provide some kind of healing also. I don't know if that made sense, but. It does, and, and it, there's a, it's a little horrifying actually to think about, and this is where my own, it's, it is my own lunch office. It's, it's actually a very accurate word. When I think about, let's say, the four of you working with my mother and how exposing that would be. I see. Me, yeah, yeah. It actually has nothing to do with my mom. That's just my own yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, of course. You know I, mean? I would feel the same with anyone working with my mom. Right. Yeah. 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 It's very exposing. But, yeah. you know, our, I would say my favorite yeah. clients are the ones that are the most challenging because, you know, they've got this life mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. strategy built up and it's mm -hmm. so protective. And, and then they're at a time in their life where they depended mm -hmm. on others again for the first time. Yeah, and um, I just had this thought that you know, like the harder they come, the gentler they fall. <laughs> and then the healing, tell the healing stories with clients who came to us, tremendously feisty and angry, and then how they fell in love with the team and softened. You know, and I don't want to give you a false hope here or anything, but it can happen.
And also, Gretchen, too, I mean, being so intimately involved in a situation like this with a close friend, I mean, I feel like we all strive to try not to have judgment, you oh, know? Absolutely. And it's not a reflection on any of us how our parents, you know, uh, manifest. So please consider us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> doing, a, doing a little marketing. <laughs> Or not. I'm teasing, but really, honestly, you know that. Believe me. Yeah. When you make it to Wheat Ridge. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, example, like Joanne used to contact me all the time, wanting, you know, trying to find people who I was connected with or, you know, she had a connection with for her mother because you wanted that personal connection with that person that was caring for your mom, right? Oh, just that um, I guess what comes up for me, you know, of course, just being a caregiver was that the work that you are all doing, both in Wintour's Elder Care and WCS and International, it's wonderful. It's, it's dignified. And how can we bring this to people who can't afford this kind of care? Because if I could afford this for my mom, and I had Wintours, I had someone from your team come, and she was great. She interviewed my mom, and, I, and she said, you know, this is what it would look like, and I said, I really can't afford that, and she gave me some suggestions, and that was great. I think that was Kate. Was that Kate? Did you come to my mom? <laughs> <laughs> at Golden West? Okay, it was Kate. And it was great. It was safe at home. You, you told me you thought they were really good. But... It just saddens me that so many, especially with the suffering, what really kills me is the aloneness, yeah. the how lonely. We don't want people to be alone in their suffering. And it costs money. Yeah. It, it feels like it always comes down to the resources. And I don't know, on a political level, how can we get this so that this is the norm, the way you, we treat people? So I'm just putting that out there. I just, Gretchen, what you were talking about um, sparked for me mutual recovery and how for a lot of us, you know, we're drawn to this work because of our family dynamics and how it's actually such a gift for us to be able to experience, you know, working with others and, um, um, in response to what you're saying uh, in working with elder care, may I just say on behalf, we're working on it. I mean, we really, we're really working on it. Um, what what's possible, what's, what kind of education is possible, what kind of low-cost care is possible. Um, yeah. Natural teams. Natural yeah. teams. Um, Interconnect inter with more of the therapeutic team. Yeah. yeah. And long-term care insurance. And, yeah. and then there's for some of them. Um, they're to know what's <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in the world, yeah. Norway, she said, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jody. Jody's our education director, just so everyone knows. Uh -huh. right. Yeah, um, I'm an op the ops manager for commu Windhorse Community Services, and so I'm very interested in ops, right? You know, and so I know there are, other than the obvious of what's been talked about today, the differences between WCS and elder care, like, can you talk a little bit about operations a little bit? Like, like, uh, like, what is the team constellation? Do you have team supervisors and IPs and TLs and BAs and all of that? Do you, and what is the, your average team size? And, and uh, just a little bit more on, like, how do you guys operate differently than WCS does? Why don't we meet? <laughs> well, I've been trying. <laughs> Oh my God.
much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Can I just say one thing? Please. And it's just the biggest, most poignant piece of this whole um, model and the re relational medicine piece is kind of what, what um, sometimes we can't do it for our families and we can't do it for our children. And, and I think for me as a child um, of parents who I can't actually do that for them, the care and the attachment piece. Um, but I can, I can do that relationally with the, my clients and they can do that for me. So it's a parallel process. And actually as I have found that as people age, um, there's that opportunity as the structure softens to actually do a major kind of healing work with the early attachment wounds. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's miraculous. And so I guess I just wanted to kind of point to that since we were kind of talking about it anyway. So, so briefly, just really briefly, shall I just yeah. paint a picture here? So we have how many BAs? We have 70 BAs. We have about 20 team leaders, right? And about eight team supervisors. And... Um, no housemates right now. We have one house. No, we don't have any housemates right now. We don't have as many therapists on teams because the elder population is, doesn't want therapy, named as therapy. So we have, but we have a clinic. We have a Windhorse, what's the name of it? Windhorse Elder Care Counseling Clinic. Windhorse Council, no, wait a minute. What Windhorse is it? Elder Care Counseling Clinic. Windhorse Counseling, counseling Clinic. Clinic for <laughs> elders and their families. <laughs> We want to be sensitive about this, you know, because there are wind horses around the world, around the community. So, but we have a counseling clinic for family members and elders. But on teams, like I was a therapist on a team, but it, it doesn't happen that often. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that common. Be, but the therapy obviously happens in the basic attendance and in the household. And so just to say that. So our teams do consist of basic attenders. Team leaders, team supervisors. Sometimes we have co-team leaders on larger teams. We do have housemates at times when we do 24-7 care. And you know, we, we work in a variety of ways. We have teams that are really small with just a BA and a you know, team supervisor. Um, we have you know, larger teams, medium-sized teams. So it really just depends on the need. Very similar to how Windhorse Community Services does it. But you know, we do provide psychotherapy, but it's, um, it's usually outside of the team, not normally part of the team. Um, but we do have that as well at times. So. One, one last thing, I know we're over, but the difference also with the two organizations is in community services, as the work progresses, you decrease the team. Reduce. Yeah, yeah, that is the difference, so you right? The door with one basic, two baby shifts in a week, but then as the person's life unfolds, it increases. Mm -hmm. Or they go to a facility and we go there with them, support them there for continuity of relationship. And so isn't that interesting? So we expand, mm -hmm. our teams expand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And I, I, we also um, work with people's budgets, and um, mm -hmm. we function in teams sometimes without a team supervisor to make it more workable because um, these teams can last for 10 years, helping someone through the whole dying process. Um, so yeah. get creative about it. But we do need to end, and I'm so sad for that because um, I know there are beautiful questions sitting within all of you, and there's um, so much more to be said here and shared here. Um, so let's keep doing that outside of this time. And, um, and thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks, everybody.